Pick a move in the ring. You can hit me with the words you fling. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Nicholas Akin here on South China Morning Post, SCMP MMA in Hong Kong. And guess who's back? The boss man himself, Mr. Chatri Sichotsung. Chatri, good to see you again uh, for another one of our chats. I always enjoy them. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I also enjoy our chats. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime, anytime. And uh, it's a it's very good timing, actually, because we're one day out from the Atomweight Grand Prix, one championship, Empower, the first all-female card in one championship history, in, in MMA history, I think, uh, in terms yep. of global mega organizations. Um, just tell me a little bit about this. How relieved are you that this is finally happening? Man, I'm super ecstatic. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, all the COVID tests, have been, they've passed, everything's going well, the weight is on check. Hydration tests are going well, so um, I'll know more. I I, I, I personally enter the bubble um, this afternoon, and so I'll get a full update from my team then. Yes, because I've got to point out, it's um, it's been a long time coming. We originally, you originally announced this in, I think, October last year. After Angela right. Lee revealed she was pregnant, yeah. you said, we're right. going to have a tournament, uh, this Grand Prix, to determine right. her next challenger. Then you looked at having the start of the year, and then, it just got put back further and further. Finally, it was going to happen in May. Then Singapore had a bit of a COVID resurgence, right? Yeah. Uh, it Crazy. seems kind of like it's been cursed, hasn't it? Yeah, but we're, we're finally here, Nick. So, uh, you know, a uh, little over 24 hours. So, you know, I, I think we should be all good to go. All right. It's such a stacked card. What are you looking forward to most? Um, let's start with the Grand Prix, those four quarterfinals. Uh, which one do you think is, is really going to steal the show? I think uh, the um, Denise versus uh, Ham is going to be a barn burner. Um, I don't think it's going to go the distance. And, uh, you know, Denise is a very fast starter. She's very aggressive. So I think um, it's going to be a very fun. I think that one's going to be uh, really fun. I'm also very intrigued by Elise versus Itsuki. Um, uh, you know, high stakes and and uh, both are obviously phenomenal athletes and and. and very well rounded, um, but uh, yeah. So those are the two I'm, I'm most excited about. I mean, but but you know, I'm, I'm, it's hard to pick because Stamp versus uh, Alisona, you know, that rematch. You know, the first one was awesome. So, mm. I I was on the media call on Tuesday, and uh, Ham seems very confident. Maybe a little too overconfident. Uh, she's seems to just be dismissing Denise completely, but. Denise is the number one ranked atom weight. Um, do you think that's a mistake on her part? To, maybe she's not taking Denise seriously. Well, you know, here's the thing about Ham is is she's obviously, um, you know, one of the greatest um, atom weights in history. You know, she's even fought way above her weight classes, where you know the majority of her losses were when she fought one or two weight classes up, um, because there was no division for her um you know globally so actually this is the first time she gets to compete um on a global stage where the weight is her weight but denise is huge for her weight so um you know and very long so i don't know i think ham is overestimating denise i mean yes does ham have the edge in experience and, and the she have the edge uh, on the ground? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think Denise is, you know, purple belt level. And I think um, uh, Ham is obviously black belt level on the ground. So there's a gap there. But in striking, I think uh, because Denise is so aggressive and so wild um, and, and puts at such a tremendous pace, you know, I, I think Ham is, has her handful. I would not be shocked if Denise knocks out Ham. There you go. Uh, it's definitely, uh, for me, the one I'm look, look, most looking forward to. But uh, also a bit of intrigue for me, uh, Meng Bo and Ritu Fogat. There's been a lot of uh, crazy drama with that fight because, you know, first Ritu was in the Grand Prix, then she lost to Bina Wen and she was out. And then Julie Misa Barber came in to fight um, Meng Bo. Then Julie was out and Grace Cleveland came in. Then Grace was out and Ritu was back in after beating Lin. What was going on there? Just... Uh, can you shed some light on all of the um, changes? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, fight cards change always up, you know, for, for every major organization up until the last minute, depending on a variety of factors, injuries, you know, matchups, specific, uh, um, you know, 
countries and and and, and whatnot. And um, you know, when B Nguyen beat Ritu, I think it was very controversial. I think many people thought that Ritu won, including myself. Um, I disagree with the judges. Um, that being said, obviously, you know, the judges call it with the judges call. Um, but I also didn't feel that B had done enough to 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 enter the Grand Prix. I mean, if, if you just look at her her record, right? She's a, a 500 fighter. Um, she's actually far more skilled than a 500 fighter. You know, look at B. She's actually outstanding everywhere. Um, she's and very athletic. If you look at her balance, her her technical ability, she's outstanding. But she just didn't have drawing power to join the Grand Prix. Um, and, uh, you know, it's obvious that Ritu is, a, you know, has a huge following in India and India is an important market. So there were some considerations, of course. We wanted, first of all, the World Grand Prix to be truly international, truly from all over the world. Um, so we could definitely crown the best atom weight in the world. Um, you know, and, and as I've always said, right, I, I believe that the two best rosters in the world um, are, are UFC and, and one. And I think, you know, on the heavier weight classes, UFC takes the edge. Um, I think in the lower weight classes, um, one takes the edge in terms of the, the roster. Um, but definitely the atom weight division, there, there is no question that we have the best atom weights in the world. And uh, so I wanted full representation of the very best in the world. And, and uh, you know, there were obviously some considerations on, on, on Ritu's skill set and popularity. Plus, many people thought she beat B and had the, had the wrong decision. So I, I, you know, that didn't sit right. But of course, yeah, I mean, there were all, there's a lot of inputs that go into a card. Um, you know, of course, you, you want the very best of the best against each other. That's the first and foremost paramount. But then the secondary conditions, um, so the matchmakers worry about, let's put on the best cards with the best athletes. It doesn't matter where they're from. For me as a CEO, I have to think about a, a, a variety of factors, you know, uh, which countries are we trying to light up? You know, who has the big back? Where are we going to get the biggest viewership numbers? Because um, we are trying to grow uh, the sport and grow one. So um, so I think there's a lot of considerations. And then what ended up happening was B ended up losing and Ritu ended up winning, uh, you know, just a, a, a last month, right? A couple weeks ago. So that made it very easy for us to say, okay, look, you know, I don't think B was ever in consideration to, 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 be, to be honest um, again, because she wouldn't bring, she wouldn't bring the, the draw. She has the skills, but her record is, she needs to work on her record. Okay. And, and Julie and Grace, um, they, they've both been bumped out now to alternate bouts. Uh, well, well, we don't know about Grace Cleveland actually. What, what's going on there? Because she was set to fight Jenlyn Olsen as an alternate bout after Jenlyn beat B but that's no longer on the card. Uh, have you got any information you can uh, shed light yeah, on so, that? So, so uh, Grace posted on her Instagram. She's been experiencing dizzy spells the last month. Okay. And uh, she, yeah, she posted it. Uh, basically, uh, I think it was like two or three days ago. And um, we knew, you know, it's a medical condition. Um, and they couldn't solve it. Um, so she had MRIs, CAT scans. And the, at first they thought it was a pinched nerve in, in her neck, in her spine. And then they thought it was a brain. Death. So she's undergoing a b battery of tests. But uh, yeah, her withdrawal, it was her. It was not one. It was her saying, I can't compete. I, I, I've been, yeah, re read her Instagram post. Okay. And um, we do still have one alternate belt on this card. So Mei Yamaguchi uh, will be fighting against Julie Mizubaba, who was originally in the Grand Prix at one point. So um, are, are you planning on doing any other alternate bouts? Are, are you going to run that uh, Jenilin against Grace? Uh, is, is Jihin Radzuan maybe going to get something on another Yeah, card? yeah. So, 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 yeah, I think Jihin's also, uh, you know, a great competitor and deserves to be in the Grand Prix. So, yeah, definitely, um, you know, I, I haven't actually followed up on the situations after Grace withdrew because Grace literally withdrew at the last minute, like, a few days ago. And so I don't think uh, the, the the matchmaking team has even um, thought about another alternate yet because we have so much on our hands for this event already. Um, I think after the event, um, there'll be more clarity. But yeah, I, I think there will be um, Jenna Lin versus uh, Cleveland or Jenna Lin versus somebody, maybe Jihan. Okay. Uh, it's almost hard as well to overlook the main event of this card, uh, Zhang Jingnan, defending his joint title against Michelle Nicolini. Um, I asked Michelle on Tuesday, uh, you know, whether she was a little bit annoyed about having to wait two years. Um, was that purely because of COVID and timing that she didn't get the title shot immediately after yeah, she yeah, no, beat we, 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 Yeah, no, we, we, 
like I said, COVID has thrown uh, a lot of, has created a lot of issues for all the major global sports organizations around the world. Um, it seems like we're getting out of it now. So there's going to be more regular cadence um, and, and more visibility. But yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of fights, a lot of big fights, a lot of athletes didn't get the chance to compete um, in the last year, year and a half or so. Um, you know, we've tried to give fights to everybody, but, you know, we're, we're cycling through. Um, and, uh, you know, the next 12 months, we should be back on our regular event schedule. And then all the athletes will be, you know, super happy with how many times they compete a year. And I also asked Zhang whether she felt that the straw weight division maybe needs some beefing up and she would love to see one sign some more straw weights and maybe have a, a Grand Prix there. Is that something that might be in your plans down the road? Yeah, definitely. That, that, that is definitely up, uh, up. Uh, I mean, I love the Grand Prix format and, and I think, um, you know, fans love it. So it's something to definitely want to do. And I agree with you, you know, Jing Nan is such a dominant competitor um, that we need to make sure we, we, we continue to sign straw weights that can compete with her. So it's, you know, um, but I wouldn't count Michelle out, right? Michelle uh, gave a handful to Angela Lee and even beat Angela. So um, Michelle is a uh, eight time world champion in jujitsu. So she can finish the fight at any moment, you know? Absolutely. Should be a great fight. Uh, also just how happy are you that prelims are back, you know, that you can have the lead card again and, uh, it's been a while we've been having these um, small five or six fight cards yeah. and we've been having yeah. some taped cards yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I mean, everything is just down to, to COVID, right? Like, uh, and, and now we're, we're, we're getting um, government approval from Singapore to come back to, you know, our big, normal, big cards and all live. And so again, you know, I agree with the Singapore government. You know, if, if you look at how they've handled COVID relative to the rest of the world, right? The country is currently 80% vaccinated now. And, you know, very minimal rates of death and, and, and just, you know, percentage wise and has done a great job, you know, managing the whole COVID thing. And, you know, A, I was super grateful that they allowed us to come back with events, you know, in the middle of the pandemic last year. Um, but, you know, part of the arrangement was they wanted, to, you know, full COVID protocols and they wanted safety measures, including smaller bout cards so that they would be easier to control the testing and the safety and the medicals of anything COVID if there was an outbreak, right? So that was the kind of the thing. But now that we are, the country's, you know, almost fully vaccinated and and, and uh, things are moving in the right direction. And also I think, you know, one is, has uh, de developed a lot of trust with the Singapore government or earned a lot of trust rather, uh, because we've been able to execute events without any health issues uh, related to COVID. Did the government insist on anything like fighters being vaccinated or anything like that? Yes, yes. Um, just like uh, I believe Abu Dhabi came out, the government said, right? Yeah. Um, so all of our athletes have to be vaccinated in order to compete in Singapore. Um, now, we are planning uh, events outside of Singapore, rest of the world. So it won't be an issue for um, unvaccinated fighters, but um, for Singapore, you have to be fully vaccinated. Have you got a time frame maybe on when you might be putting on those events outside of Singapore? Um, it was going to be in Q4 and it's still up in the air. Um, but, you know, everything is a touch and go situation right now. Like it's, it's the thing that has changed most is we have to have a much more flexible mindset because, you know, just things are changing all the time. You know, normally even this business as, as a whole already you need a flexible mind because the fight cards are constantly changing because people drop out and this and the other. And but yeah, but you know, COVID has made it a little bit more tricky. But yeah, it is what it is. So uh, not not going to win. But again, we have a huge uh, 2022 plan um, in terms of number of events, getting back to uh, pre-COVID levels, um, a big big schedule, and and a lot of new exciting things happening. Um, yeah, yeah, there was some increasing talk as well that. The, the debut of one in the US might be coming closer because the rule set was approved in, um, I want to say Colorado. Uh, is, is there any update on when you might be uh, putting on a show in the US? So yeah, I will. I, I can confirm that the um, global rule set uh, has been approved by a few states in, in the US. And and uh, obviously, you know, our, our team in the US has been doing a lot of great work there. Um, but I don't want to commit yet to a date. Have we locked, have we booked venues and stuff? We have, 
but I haven't pulled the trigger in terms of saying, okay, we're going to do it for sure on that date this year, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, but we have date secured and location, you know, and, and, and location secured, but it's just um, juggling a bunch of different things, including our 10th anniversary show. You know, that's a, you know, it's going to be the biggest show in history, bigger than one century and bigger than everything we've ever done. So just trying to think through the logistics of that, you know, do we do that in the U S do we do that in Singapore? Do we, where do we do it? You know, wh where does it make most sense? So there's a lot of moving parts like that. If it was just a regular show, then I think we would, you know, it, it would be less, um, st there, there would be less stakes, obviously. Yes. I was going to ask you about the, the anniversary show. I think you told my, my buddy, Tom Taylor for Bleacher Report that it would be December. Yeah. Um, what are we talking here? Bigger than century? Are we going to have another double yeah. event? How many title fights are we going to have? You know, you're going to have to wait. I just, I literally, <laughs> uh, the, the meeting before Nick was literally with the entire competition team going through the car, December card. And I was blown away. I'm like, my God, there's some really crazy stuff in there that um, mind blowing stuff. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't break the news yet. I wish I could next week. I, I think we'll be ready. Okay. Um, so well, next we... week, next week, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be breaking the news on a few fights and the actual date of our one X show. Okay. Uh, yes. I, I mentioned before I, I pressed the button to go live here that we, we had Michael Chavello on podcast uh, earlier this morning and he said that you've got a revolutionary announcement to make tomorrow as well. So, uh, I, he said, "You, I won't get anything out of you." But um, it said it's about the Atom Week Grand Prix. Is, is is so people can they expect something huge there? Shoot, I don't even know. What he, I don't know what he's talking. I haven't <laughs> talked to Chevello. I haven't talked to Chevello since the last event, so I don't know what he's talking about. Um, a revolutionary announcement regarding uh, the Atom Week, and I yeah, I don't have anything. I don't think I have anything planned, but I'll know. I'll know later today when I when I, when I enter the the bubble, then I'll get a full debrief from my team on on um, you know the sh the run of show and, and and all the key uh, things that uh, we'll be talking about on, on the on the <laughs> opening and all that stuff. So I, I I haven't been briefed yet. Okay, um, and just another one quickly on the Grand Prix. Uh, I know originally you wanted to finish it by September and then have the winner face Angela in November. What's the rough time frame now for the final and then the, the Angela so, fight? Right. So the Adam Waite final is scheduled for our December 1X show. Okay. And uh, the winner will then face Angela in February. Wow. All right. Yeah. How, how has Angela been? Um, she's been back training. Have you spoken to her? How is she feeling after returning to training after giving birth in April? Yeah, you know she's she's back in training and uh, you know easing her body back. But I mean, it's 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 hard, you know. Um, on one hand, she has more fire than she's ever had. Uh, you know, having a, a a baby daughter really, you know, she wants to to do her daughter proud. And at the same time, I think she really misses the action. I think she was a little bit burnt out um, before, and, and now she has that hunger, the eye of the tiger back. Um, so, and, and and you know. I love the banter that's going on between Denise and, and, and uh, Angela. So I, that, that fight has to happen no matter what. I mean, <laughs> whether there's a, you know, whether Denise wins a Grand Prix or not, at some point, I think Angela and Denise have to, uh, to settle their beef. Yeah. Do you feel, say, even if Denise loses this thing, this uh, fight with Ham, uh, given that she was number one ranked uh, or still is, and then, you know, you look like that fight was going to happen. Uh, would there be a, a situation where she might get a future shot, say, if Angela defends the belt against the winner of the Grand Prix? Yeah, I, 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 I definitely, because I think, you know, I think uh, Denise is phenomenal uh, and, and she is the number one contender. Uh, it's just unfortunate that what happened, you know, in, in terms of timing for her, from her perspective, from Denise's perspective. But, um, you know, Denise now has a chance to be a double champion and she can win the whole Grand Prix and then, if she beats down, she becomes a world champion too. So it's like, um, I think Denise is, is, is really well set up um, for success either way. Right. But yes, um, I think fans are definitely, you know, I've been, I've received a lot of messages from fans that saying they want to see Denise and um, Angela fight no matter what now, because of the, uh, the banter back and forth, you know? <laughs> yeah. I enjoy it myself. Uh, also there's a stacked revolution card uh, also in September, so uh, you've already announced, yes, three title fights. Christian Lee uh, is back against uh, Oak, and then uh, 
Joshua Passio is finally back. Uh, it's been about 18 months since we saw Joshua. Do, can you um, explain why he was out so long again? Was it just COVID and timing or were there any injuries or things like that? Um, no, I think it was just COVID. Um, uh, he had a bout of COVID as well. So there was just things like, you know, a bunch of the Lakai fighters got COVID and, and uh, were unable to compete. And they just, you know, we had booked a lot of them like Lito and, 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 uh, Lito was booked, you know, months ago. And so was, uh, um, Stephen Lohman's, uh, debut. Um, and then, yeah, so just this COVID thing has thrown, uh, you know, um, everything for a loop and, you know, it, it was at one point Baggio an, an issue COVID, but now it seems to have died down and the athletes are all vaccinated and everything and they're all healthy and ready to go. So, um, yeah, it'll just be for me, I'll just be happy to get back into a regular cadence uh, with our biggest stars in the way we were, you know, uh, pre COVID, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful again for throwing the events and we still obviously have still big events happening um, like the Re one revolution and stuff, but you know, I, um, it, it's still, it's just still been very, very tough. Like last 18 months have been very, very tough for myself and for, for my teammate, my teammates at one and, and obviously our athletes and, and obviously the rest of the world. So it's not just us, but, it's been tough. Yeah. I mean, I miss being there live at the shows. Uh, yeah. Next year or yeah. something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, one guy who has been active, Christian Lee, this is his third title defense in 11 months. Um, Christian just seems like a man on a mission, doesn't he? To just prove he is the best in as quickly as possible. Uh, so if, if, he, if he beats Oak, um, where does he go next? Because he's cleared out that top five. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I still think, you know, uh, at some point an Eddie Alvarez versus Christian Lee set fight makes sense, right? I mean, Eddie has to get on the winning side of things, of course, but I think that is something the fans want to see. Um, and, and also, you know, I do believe Eddie deserves, you know, to be up there, you know, just based on his, his entire, you know, body of work in his entire career. It's just, um, he's definitely, you know, one of the greatest um, lightweights, right? I mean, whether you put him top 10 or top five or top 20, whatever the number is, he's definitely one of the greatest lightweights in history. Uh, again, no man, no, no person has ever won both UFC and Bell tour champions and, and vying for a third one here, right? Third world title, uh, in, in one. And if Eddie is able to do it, then, then he'll be solidified as, as definitely one of the greatest lightweights, uh, of all time. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that fight makes sense. You know, I just uh, think, you know, Eddie's had a rough go as, uh, as I've always said, right. I, mean, I really believe one, you know, has the best roster in the world. Um, you know, it's, it, our, our athletes may not be as popular yet as, as, um, you know, uh, some of the, our, our U S counterparts, like in the UFC, but again, like, you know, speaking as a lifelong martial artist and being as objective as possible, I look at the heavier divisions and I'm like, okay, you know, I, UFC has an edge on us. If I look again, the lightweight division and below, I think we have the edge over them for sure. And theoretically, it's not too difficult to get Eddie or for Eddie to get himself a title shot just in terms of if you do that rematch with Yuri Lapkus, Yuri is still ranked number two, right? So yeah. in theory, yeah. you do that rematch, Eddie wins that and he looked like he was going to win that fight before the uh, red right. card. That puts him right back there, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, definitely Eddie's one win away from a title shot. Yeah, I agree with that. One okay. or two. Yeah. Um, what about Eddie's old yes, buddy? I, yes, I would, I, would, I would at some point like to make that fight. Yeah, Christian Lee versus Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to see it, obviously. And yeah. I think it, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And uh, All right. Well, well, with Demetrius Johnson then, have you got anything in the works for him after that? Yes. Lost he, to he, yes. He, he has a huge fight coming up, uh, you know, in December. Um, and, and I think it's one that the fans are going to love. Um, and again, it's a surprise. I, I, I can't – I'll <laughs> announce it next week. But it's okay. not, not going to be a cookie-cutter, you know, um, typical – uh, fight that you guys that fans are accustomed to i'll just leave it at that all right look forward to that think, um think, think about pride and the creative matchmaking pride did and you're going to see some funny crazy stuff as well uh for our, for our 10th year anniversary show okay sounds good uh, i got to ask you about a couple other potential fights um yeah last time i spoke to you you did say 
Gary Tonin and Tan Lei, that was the direction you wanted to go for the featherweight title. Is is that still the idea? Yeah, I know so, Tan so has that, had some yes, problems with his hand. This is one of those things. Yeah, it's just one of those things. Um, it was supposed to happen in September, then October, and, and, and then first it was Tan Lei's hand, and then now it was Gary's, um, was it an ankle or knee? Um, I think it was his knee. Um, so then, you know, Tan Lei one more time. So I think it's going to go down in November um, right now. Uh, it's just been one of those, uh, just, you know, in, in hindsight, obviously 2020 is, you know, hindsight, but um, probably shouldn't have waited for that. But I think people want to see that fight so bad. So we, we, we kept on saying, yeah, let's make this happen. Let's make this happen. And, and you know, Tan Lei got injured with his hand and then extended out. And then Gary got injured with his leg. And then, yeah, so it was just one of these things like, ugh, you know, frustrating. Yeah, and another one I think people want to see, uh, Bibiano Definitely. Fernandez and John Lineker. Yes. Have, have you got any update on whether those two are going to fight? What's going on with Bibiano? So I, I, I do think that fight is going to happen. Um, I believe uh, I have a call now with Bibiano um, next week, I believe. Um, at least that's uh, what I believe. Uh, Matt Hume is trying to arrange that call uh, for me and Bibi to see if we can, uh, you know, come to agreement. And, and, and uh, so... But yeah, I think the fans want to see Bibby versus Lineker. I think that, that will be a barn burner of a fight as well. Yeah, and um, he's obviously a bit upset. Uh, have you reached out to him uh, at all just to reassure him? Like, you know, yeah, we do love you, Bibby. Don't worry, because he's one of the one championship originals, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, these things happen though, right? It's, it's uh, I love Bibby. Bibby is a phenomenal guy. You know, I, I first met him actually even before before one I, I was a corner man for Shinya Aoki in, in dream and uh that's when that's how I met Bibi we were on the bus together and, and we just began talking we hit it off and so yeah I love Bibi as a person but you know things have to make sense right economically and, and everything has to be win-win it's he has to feel like he's gotten um you know the right deal and we have to feel the right way right it, it's, it's just and and if you're not putting up viewership numbers you can't command big dollars or if you don't have a a large fan base it's hard it's just hard i mean bibi is a phenomenal athlete he's he, he's uh his in achievements in jiu-jitsu in 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 dream in one are, are incredible de de definitely he's one of the greatest bantamweights in history right um but for some reason he doesn't have a lot of fans. He just, and he doesn't garner viewers and, you know, it might be because he's a gentleman. I, I really don't know. I mean, these things are like mysteries, right? Some people generate massive fandom and some people don't. And, and, and there is what you see now more and more is of course, skill set matters. You know, we have the best roster in the world, but the people going to get paid the best are if you're the best in the world and you are able to drive viewership numbers, pay-per-view numbers, However, you want to, however, whatever metric. If you're popular with fans, you're going to get paid a lot. And actually, now you see, yeah. like, in, in, in some cases, all you need to be is popular with fans, and you don't even have to be good. <laughs> you know, I don't want to <laughs> say, name, say names, but I mean, there, there are a lot of fighters out there that are good, but they're not phenomenal, but they're getting paid like they're phenomenal. So, you know, it's a crazy time in combat yeah. sports. I mean, where do you think. Um... Adriano Moraes falls on that spectrum then because, you know, he is, uh, he proved it. He proved he is yeah. the man. He beat Demetrius Johnson, but also maybe he's had a little problem connecting with fans. Is it yeah. something to do with Brazilians and maybe not catching on in Asia or is there a language barrier? No, I I, I, I think also it's, it's um, Adrian is such a humble, sweet guy, um, you know, very low key and it doesn't, you know, um, He's a very quiet, he's, a, you know, he's just a very quiet person. Uh, is he the best flyweight on the planet? For sure, bar none, there's no question. He, he will run through any flyweight, um, full stop. Um, but, you know, he's not super popular yet. I, I think he might be when we, when we go to the States, right? When, when we start throwing events in the US, things can change very quickly. So right now he's not necessarily resonating in Asia, but um, in the US he might. And um, I, there was a, another couple of fights. Quickly, I just want to ask you, uh, Ong Lan Sang, he seems to be hinting he's coming back soon and likely against Yushin Okami. Uh, is that in the works? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that excited about that fight, to be honest. I think that would be, you know, kind of a, a, a snooze fest of a fight. I just don't see <laughs> that. 
that exciting. And, and, and I also don't know what is the reason for that fight, right? Other than the fact that they, I think Yushin called him out. But but that's not enough of a reason for me to put a fight. I want to put on exciting fights that the fans want to see, that they love, that really um, drives uh, massive TV ratings, obviously, and obviously ma massive uh, online uh, metrics and all that. The, the things that I care about as a CEO. Um, and I just don't see that fight making sense. I think, for example, I think Big Dash versus uh, Angla 3 and reviving that, I think that could make for some interesting, and, and their fighting styles are very exciting. So I think that can make a lot of sense, you know? I mean, I think you could put Angla against a wooden chair and it would still get millions of viewers in <laughs> Myanmar, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. But no, but you see, Angla brings it. He, ha he, he has the personality, he has the style. Yes, he's he's he's, he's humble and kind-hearted outside of the, of the cage, but you know his in cage persona uh, is just very very fun and dynamic. You know, he's a beast. Yeah, he looked very good against Leandro, didn't he? Uh, first round knockout. Um, yeah, incredible. What, what what's he got to do to get into the title picture? Is he something you're not thinking about? Would you rather he strings a, f a few wins together first after he lost twice to uh, René de Ritter? Yeah, I think that's a game plan. Uh, you know, he he also wants to work on his jiu-jitsu and his wrestling before he faces uh, uh, Renia again. And, of course, we have to see Renia defending, right? I mean, um, you know, uh, Renia had a very tough time against Atitis. I actually thought Atitis beat Renia, right, when they fought. Um, obviously, uh, the judges thought differently, but I thought Atitis won. And so the fact that Angla destroyed Atitis and Renia struggled with a Titus. That makes for an interesting story as well. So let, let's see Renier defend. Um, clearly his jiu-jitsu is world-class. I mean, his body type is very much like Roger Gracie's, you know, very long. And um, that makes for the, a nightmare when, when, when you're grappling with somebody. And, uh, but is Renier a good striker? Is he a good wrestler? No, he's not there yet. So he's got he's to elevate his game a little bit everywhere else um, and, and prove himself as a champion by defending his title a few times. What do you want to do with Vernier first then? Because uh, he wants a heavyweight shot against Arjan. <laughs> but Arjan also said, why don't you defend one of your belts first? Uh, are you looking at Abasov against Derrida? That could be a fun fight. Yeah, that, that could be an interesting fight because both are tough on the ground. And yeah, that, that, that could be, you know. Um, I uh, So my, my, my team has floated a bunch of different ideas for Vernier's first time talent defense. Um, but uh, we haven't made a firm decision yet. Yeah, it wouldn't be the heavyweight against Arjun. No, 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 definitely not. I, I, I just don't see that. I, I don't see that. Uh, I don't think Arjun thinks that makes sense either. I mean, Arjun wants to defend his heavyweight title against a heavyweight. Um, so. Yeah, I think he wants Kang G1, right? Yeah, but I think Kang G1 is still too early in his career. Uh, I'd like to see more, a few more wins by Kang G1. Okay. And, um, you know, we, as you can see, we've, we've been making a lot of heavyweight signings. We continue making yeah. heavyweight signings. So you're going to see the heavyweight division getting more and more stacked over time. Uh, you know, it's, it's again, the one division in which we didn't spend a lot of time and effort historically, but now we're, we're, we're going all out on it. Okay. And uh, yes, very quickly. Sorry. I just want to ask you uh, about TNT. Uh, have you got any update on whether you're going to be back on there for some live shows? Is there a deal in the works? Yeah. So, so, so uh, I will just say that, um, multiple discussions are going ongoing and that, uh, we are, um, yeah, working on a new deal in the U S um, not necessarily with Turner, but we're in talks with everybody uh, right now. Yeah. I suppose, you know, you, you had this Nielsen report. Um, you, that, I suppose that helps, right? There's some, some positive numbers in there, some very positive numbers showing your, your viewership. Um, I'm sure TNT would take a look at that, huh? Yes. Yes. Well, I, I'll, yeah. I mean, um, so uh, I have been in discussions with all the major U.S. broadcasters um, in the last few weeks. I'll just say that all the digital players, all the major um, networks. Um, yeah, so there's strong interest for one. And so it's just all about, you know, finding the, you know, the right partner to, 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 to make sure we go to U.S. in a big way. And obviously we are planning our U.S. events time with that. Right. So there's. Um, you know, all those things that we, that you're, all the activity you're hearing in, in the rumor mill, you know, uh, I'd say um, a good chunk of it is true. Some of it is nonsense, but a good chunk is true. Like <laughs> we are going to States, we are going to have events on ground. 2022 is going to be a big year for us in the U.S. Um, and we want to find the biggest 
baddest broadcast partner in the US. And if that ends up being Turner, that's great. But but you know, we we want a lot more um, investment by our media partner in the US so that we are on primetime TV, you know, every week or every other week with live events on ground, right? That's the um, I mean, my ultimate vision uh, before COVID, you know, internally, I, you know, I wanted 50 live events uh, in Asia primetime and I wanted 50 live events uh, on ground in the U.S. live primetime. That was my, you know, I knew it would take a few years to get there, but I said, like, guys, what are we, what are we gunning, gunning for? Uh, you know, I, I, and that's the kind of thing I want to have ideally 50, you know, events in, in the, each region and light up the world every Friday, Saturday, um, that'd be awesome, you know, so, the, but then again, it's gonna take a few years. It's not, it's not imminent. Right. Yeah. And I guess, I guess finally, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, I know the the 10th anniversary show is going to be in December, but I think the 10th anniversary falls in this month of uh, September. Um, just could you reflect a little bit on, on that journey and yeah, how has it, how has it been 10 years? What, and then what's the next 10 years going to look like? Yeah, you know, uh, when Nielsen came out with a report two months or three months ago, and, and uh, we were top 10 in the world, as world's largest sports properties, you know, I was uh, surprised and, and, and um, thrilled, obviously. And then you look at the names of those other top 10 players, and you realize all those other top 10 players have been around for 70 to 100 years. So EPL <laughs> or NBA or F1. And we're the only one, we're the youngest top 10 property, you know, having been, only been 10 years. And I'll tell you, it's, it's, I feel like I'm the Forrest Gump of sports. Like, <laughs> I, 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 obviously, when I started one, I thought it could be big, uh, you know. Uh, but then if you said 10 years later, you'd be in the top 10 for TV viewership, for online viewership, all that stuff. Um, you know, I would be like, yeah, whatever, right? I, it, but um, I think what we're doing resonates, uh, you know, across the fact that we're our strategy of putting everything on free to air TV, on pay TV, on digital social, and making um, martial arts accessible to the masses. That's been our strategy. Um, now, of course, in the future, we will have pay per view events. We will have different, you know, we will have different tiers of, of monetization efforts. But when I look at this, you know, for me, the, mo the the best thing of this ten years is I've had the time of my life. Like, you know, as a lifelong martial artist, the fact that you know, almost every weekend I get to sit cage side, watch some of the greatest athletes in, in, in history on the planet go compete. Um, you know, it, it's been just a, a crazy, crazy ride. And why I say I'm Forrest Gump is because, you know, I started this thing and I just ran and ran and ran and I had no idea that we, we would be where we are right today. I had no idea, you know, and so I'm very grateful. But what I do believe now, and I've told this to my team, you know, there's nothing that can stop us now from being – you know, top five, top three, top one in the world in terms of most watched sports property. Uh, when I look at EPL, when I look at NBA, when I look at F1, when I look at what they're doing, um, their event schedule to their social media, digital to their um, overall corporate strategy, you know, I, I, there's no difference. Like, I, I feel like um, in some areas we have a, actually advantage over the, over a lot of these uh, incumbent sports properties um, because we're, we were born in the digital era, so we really understand millennial and Gen Z fan base uh, much better than uh, the incumbent sports properties, right? And, um, you know, if you look at the other sports properties, their biggest challenge is typically, you know, their their fan base is only 20 to 30 percent millennials and Gen Zs versus one, we're 89 percent millennials and Gen Zs. So just by definition, not to sound morbid, over the next 5, 10, 15 years, the incumbent sports properties fan base are dying. They're, they're literally dying. They're all 40, 50 years old. And, you know, um, and ours is, is young. So when you look at the future of one, um, it's the math says it all. Um, and then the fact that we are, uh, you know, entering the U S and, and, and going to do events in Europe, um, as well. There's just so many exciting things that are happening that we we, I told my team yesterday, we are at day one, day one. That's how I feel. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for where we are, but I'm nowhere um, satisfied or content. I, I believe that it's just the beginning of the journey still. Wow. Uh, 
That's awesome. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time as always. I, I do enjoy it. Our fans enjoy it. Um, final word from you. What can everyone expect tomorrow? If, if for some reason people are still on the fence, why have they got to tune in? This is the single greatest all-female card put on in history of martial arts. There is no if, answer, but you can ask any martial arts expert. Um, if you love martial arts, if you believe um, in, in female athletes, it doesn't matter what sport it's from. You've got to come watch and see the greatest action, the stories unfold, the dreams broken, the dreams made. You know, uh, tomorrow it's all going down from our world title fight all the way down to our prelims. The best of the best female athletes. Yeah, we didn't even mention Anissa Mexon. Sorry, but she's making her yes. one debut. Oh, right. uh, I mean, that's exactly. Yeah. There you go. This is literally the, yeah, I, I mean, pound for pound, this card is is, is definitely, there's never been a, a, a caliber of this card across all different martial arts like that. Like that, that, yeah, no question, right? Between the main event, the Grand Prix, and Anissa's debut, you're right. Yeah, so much going on. Uh, can't wait to see it. And thank you again, Chachi. Um, really appreciate your time. And uh, good luck tomorrow. I'll be watching. Thank you so much, Nick. Take care. Uh, you too. Always a pleasure.